Jack's Rambly Bits. Hey everybody, welcome back. I have had a busy weekend and a busy several uh, days of planning prior to that. Uh, so you're all probably wondering what it is I'm going to ramble about this week. And while the subject is more or less 2B2T related, I hope you all permit me to, instead of doing a deeper dive into some element of 2B2T history or the like, as I had been doing, uh, I just wanted to take a small sort of uh, side glance at something that I've been doing for the last several weeks now. Um, I can't believe it. It's been about a week and a half and uh, about in that amount of time I've been quite busy getting all of the, the preparations and stuff going. Uh, for those of you who don't know or who don't watch streams or are unaware, I am making a game driven by Redstone on 2B2T. Uh, it's inspired by a game called Decked Out, which if you don't know, Decked Out was a mini game made by uh, Tango Tech about three-ish years ago and it was a uh, smash hit. Uh, Tango Tech of the Hermitcraft server and I got to watching some of that stuff and I was enjoying it and I, I really like look forward to you know what that was and it was cool and all and then about and I, I lost track of the uh development of this, but a few years later, Tango Tech, starting in late August of 2022, ended up making a sequel, or starting this the groundwork for the sequel, uh, Decked Out 2. And this past August, Decked Out 2 more or less opened, so it was about a year later, uh, and it was a smash hit. Like, you would not believe how amazing that game turned out to be. And so for, since we've got, you know, all the 1.19 stuff, and 2BGD is in pretty darn good shape, I would say. I figure I I want to try my hand at making a good sized complex mini game. Uh, so I'm going to be making something similar to Decked Out 2. Uh, I'm going to take a lot of cues from it, but I'm not going to like make a uh, a rip off or anything. You know me, I'm going to do my own thing. I enjoy making my own original attempts at things like this. And um, yeah, I've decided I was going to make it in the style of like a Metroidvania, which if you know what Metroidvania games are, you know more power to you. Um, basically, they are games in the style of of Metroid or Castlevania. And in those games, um, the player is tasked with running around an enclosed environment and you explore and solve puzzles and you you more or less you know you survive a lot of these games have an emphasis on combat um my game will not my game is going to be a little bit more survival horror um focused um and we'll get to the theme here in a minute um and the biggest most interesting aspect of it is you find power-ups and you find um enhancements you know health increases and things of that nature that allow you to survive longer and longer and overcome you know, monsters and stuff, things like that, basically. That's a Metroidvania in a nutshell. And so that's what I wanted to make, but on 2B2T with this fantastic back rooms, pool rooms themed inner working. And so that's the theming of it. It's going to be survival horror with a, a pool rooms slash pseudo back rooms focus overall. And I wanted to sort of, because I'm a, I'm a back rooms fan. I, I love, you know, the, the crazed idea of like Kane Pixels is the back rooms. Um, I've been rewatching Kane Pixels series as of late. You know, I'm just, I love that sort of thing. Um, I used to think I hated horror. Then I found out oh well as it turns out there's nobody making any good horror and so i while i can't exactly like you know make a game on 2b2t that's gonna rival any of that i could theoretically make a game that is you know a survival horror type game where you're you're stuck in an area and you're you're trying to get your yourself out you can't really like fight against the mobs but you will be able to sort of you know survive with your if you keep your wits about you you'll be able to make it that's the idea that's what I'm overall aiming for. And so my goal is to hopefully make this game feel like this massive endeavor. Um, and I just kind of wanted to go about, you know, describing all the crazy features and ideas that I've had. Because I've, I've been bored. You know, I take some classes every now and then. And uh, on class days, I often find myself bored out of my skull. So I've, I've taken to jotting down ideas and planning out things. And it's, it's been surprisingly productive. Um, it used to be that I would write scripts for story time with Jack and other things in those types of situations. But honestly, like getting my ideas for this game, I think I've got a heavy, you know, hefty amount of, of interesting things that honestly, I'm, I'm still in the planning phase. So I am receptive to new ideas. For example, one of my mods suggested the idea of... Um, using lightning from a lightning rod to augment the difficulty and that was a brilliant idea i loved that so i'm i immediately took that and he was he was happy he was able to give me something you know something i could run with 
And so if you have any uh, suggestions along those lines, the planning phase is still, you know, more or less open at this point. So like, don't hesitate to give me, uh, give me your thoughts and your, your hopes and dreams and stuff. I will see if it's possible to try and incorporate them in. Uh, but uh, don't, uh, don't start suggesting anything or start typing anything until you've heard more or less everything I've already had written down thus far. It might be that I've already thought of something you thought of or that the idea, you know, might not, you may, you may rethink what you're thinking and it may not fit into the scope of the game itself. But um, so before I really like get into the ideas, I do need to sort of tell you how Decked Out and Decked Out 2 function. Um, as the name implied, Decked Out was you were given a shulker box of playing cards. These playing cards in the original Decked Out were just written books, but in Decked Out 2, uh, using some resource pack, data pack magic, they were actually um, iron nuggets that were reskinned to look like actual playing cards. So they were very, you know, breathtakingly interesting. And I can't really do anything like that on 2B2T, but what I thought was I could use map arts to approximate cards. And so that's more or less what I've decided I was going to do. I still want the sort of card aesthetic. Um, Tango Tech intentionally made Decked Out 2 specifically to have a sort of deck building mechanic to it. And I'm not against that idea, but I'm not going to adopt that idea for my game, um, which we are tentatively calling Escape the Jack Rooms because um, it's the bathrooms, back rooms uh, sort of flavored with an escape emphasis. Um, and those of you who've been watching streams, you may wonder, you know, how are you escaping? Well, remember that sewer system that I was working on? You know, I, I started this way back in like, gosh, October. And at that time, I said I wanted to make a giant sewer complex under the base and that you would be using that for, you know, moving around and stuff. So I've decided that's how you're going to escape. I'm going to hook it up to the underground sewer system that I've been sort of mucking around with, and that will be your exit. And so um, there are eight exits, and of the eight, seven of which will be closed and the remaining eighth exit will be randomly, you know, available. And that's how you're going to escape the jack rooms. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to enjoy it. And so you're going to find cards throughout your playing. And like a Metroidvania, you find power-ups. And that's, so that's going to be your cards, your power-ups. And these are going to give you abilities. These are going to give you bonuses. You know, it'll change the layout of the dungeon, make things feel more organic. Uh, and so that brings me to the first really big, like, game mechanic that I've been thinking of, which is having the dungeon change its layout and have it be a sort of modular system where all the rooms are kind of like their own individual units, but the rooms can, they don't rearrange their positions, they rearrange their connections. And so over time, uh, hooked up to a series of daylight sensors as the night and days, you know, wax and wane, um, you will have the dungeon layout change accordingly. And then um, my mod Universum came up with this wonderful idea of when lightning strikes, you know, you can measure a lightning strike now using uh, not only the lightning rod but an observer and so when that happens you can very easily interpret that as a signal and you know do something with that for for redstone logic and so i thought yeah yeah that's a wonderful idea if lightning happens to strike because i swear to god in the last six to how many months is it? it's been it's been about it's been about six months since uh, or no it's been about seven months now since the reset and since about the seven months or so we've had 1.19 um i've been noticing a ton of lightning storms they're just they seem to be an every hour to two hour event. And so I feel like that's reasonably frequent enough to be worthy of incorporating as a game mechanic into Escape the Jack Rooms. And um, even as we speak, as you all are able to see now, I am uh, currently building the, the very lightning rods that I am talking about uh, to measure those very signals. So um, I actually innovated on the idea just a little bit. Instead of the uh, dungeon changing difficulty with lightning strikes, it will not only do that, it will also imbue any playing cards that the player may have found, and uh, those suckers are going to be well hidden and well guarded. Uh, they're not going to be easy. And when you get a playing card, it's like it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card, but it is a very powerful, you know, thing in your arsenal. Um, I'm basically treating the game as though you're in adventure mode. So, you know, no damaging the mobs, no um, no breaking blocks, you know, that type of thing. And uh, so I decided that in addition to lightning altering the, uh, the dungeon's layout, you also get 
a card if you have cards. You also get a special ability that is not written on the card. So you won't know what the ability is and you'll have to more or less figure it out from just sort of getting lucky. And obviously if lightning strikes while you're playing the game, you not only get the dungeon change and the dungeon being more difficult, but you get the bonuses of any power-up cards you've gotten. They now have their special abilities, which are lightning lock, go into effect. And I don't want it to trivialize the dungeon, but I do want it to be like, you know, you got lucky. You got a really cool ability. You you happen to hang around long enough to see this, this one really neat thing occur, you know. And so I want to have this be a lookout for every little crazy thing that could happen, I guess is the right way to put it. And so yeah, I'm just really in love with the idea of this massive underground complex beneath my base that is, you know, it's a full-blown experience, I guess is the right way to put it. Your overall uh, ability to get out will be more or less tied to your experience as well as just sort of how good are you at playing Minecraft, I guess. Are you the kind of person who survives against the odds? Are you the, or are you the type of person who you know, falls apart when the first bit of trouble happens. And so I do want death to be kind of penalizing as uh, far as game mechanics go, but I wouldn't say it's anything impossible. Um, obviously, I don't have very much in the way of layout quite yet. Uh, the dungeon, sadly, has a lot left that it needs to just really flourish as a build, but I want it to be really dense and interesting, and like, I want there to always be something new you can discover in it. Obviously, I'm designing the dungeon to not have hacks be a factor. You know, I wouldn't want a player to be, I don't know, using a reach hack or trying to sort of cheese whatever parkour or puzzle related elements there happen to be. You know, I, I would I would like to preferably keep things as heavy air quotes legitimate as possible just for the sake of the experience. And then obviously I have a uh, friend. I have uh, my mod here helping test. So he is uh, he is an invaluable member of the team. He's already helped me design uh, this wonderful area. Um, and I'll show it in a, in a minute. We worked for the last two days straight, um, up late at night even, trying to design this sort of beginning lobby area where you walk in and you are explained, you know, the rules of the game, what you should do, how to play it, etc, etc. And uh, yeah, like I'm just, I'm really excited because of all the set dressing and like the, the polish and stuff I've put into this. And as you, if you've been watching my streams, you know, you know, I've gotten a lot of polish put onto this base. There are a lot of like odd dynamic thoughts and uh, design decisions that I've made. And I really, I, I just really love it. I love what this uh, this base has become. Like, even if it doesn't, you know, let's say we get griefed in the next week or two or the next two months or whatever, the game is not finished and we, we lose everything, you know? Even then, like, I still feel like this base has lived up to my expectations. It's not Space Dock 3, but it's it's its own thing and I'm alright with that. Um, that's, that's sort of like, I guess I, this is a subject of something to ramble about at a latter date. Uh, the sort of living in the shadow of a prior achievement, which like like everybody is, you know, everybody recognizes me as the Space Falcon guy. But like, I've done other things too. I've been to other places. I've, I've met other people. Like it isn't just Space Valk that I'm, you know, Space Valk one, two, and three. That's not all there is to me, you know? And like, I hope this game really like puts that idea in people's heads that Space Valk three was amazing and all. And, you know, I wanted to do everything that I possibly could with that, but I am not just a one trick pony who can make big, pretty builds. I want to do, you know, dense, complex redstone and like amazing. I want to craft an experience, I guess is the right way to put it, you know? I don't just want to mine a craft, I want to make a craft. And that's that's how I feel about the whole thing. But anyway, let me uh, return to my design doc here and uh, sort of just sort of list out all the crazy things I intend to do with this this experience, this um, amazing game I intend to. Eventually, when I get it finished, I do want to release it as a world download. Obviously, I'll move the base to, you know, safer chunks so that it's not possible to exploit it and all that as best as possible, as best as I am able. But uh, anyway, so my first major point is that I want to have Vindicators be the big bad, the monster uh, that chases you around. And because uh, Vindicators move rather quickly, they can be equipped or rather you can get lucky and have them spawn with a sharpness uh, enchanted axe because they have just iron axes and you can't give them, uh, we've tested this already sadly, you can't give them better axes. Uh, they don't ever have the ability to pick up items. So a Vindicator with a sharp two or sharp three axe would be phenomenal. Um, preferably I would like a bunch so that you have to 
to, you know, skirt around them all. You have to be extraordinarily careful with where you move and why. And just stuff along those lines. Um, I wanted to make a, a sort of locker, and uh, you'll see in the beginning area, um, the sort of orientation room, there's a locker room adjacent to it. Um, that's the type of locker I want to make all over the dungeon, because I didn't just want to make it back rooms themed. I wanted to make it mostly pool rooms themed with like locker rooms and a sort of bathroom complex with like stray showers and toilets in weird places and then bathroom stalls in odd places and uh, just sort of like places that the things can pathfind to you but you can also hide it. Sort of give the player a fair shake. Um, vindicators will follow a player pretty much over any any other type of mob. If you name them Johnny, they'll go after anything that moves. And I thought that's a really cool idea. And so my idea uh, was to use either snow golems or villagers. I haven't decided which. Obviously, it's probably going to be snow golems because they're easier to make on the fly. Um, to move them around on purpose. And I was also going to have the uh, the whole dungeon sort of have removable, either removable wall segments or something along those lines to make the vindicators uh, that are all named Johnny uh, have them gain ice line of sight to the golems and get them pathing to the golems. This is to keep them moving around the dungeon so that the, the vindicators don't all clump up. As well as, I wanted to, because we have skulk sensors, I wanted to make the walls open and close according to where the players are moving and how they're moving, so that as you're moving throughout the dungeon, you're making noise, and the, the sort of lore aspect to this is, um, you're moving through a giant tiled area, you know, tiled areas and areas with large bodies of standing water, that's gonna echo and reflect noise like mad. And so that's sort of like hand-waving away the fact that the Vindicators will always kind of move toward you. Even if they don't have line of sight to you, even if they're on the opposite side of the dungeon, they're always gonna be kind of moving toward you, because you're gonna be constantly constantly moving around, and you're not going to know, you know, where all of these node points are, but you're going to be constantly moving around and aggravating these nodes, which are then directing the Vindicators toward your location. And I'm going to make sure to sprinkle parkour and puzzle solving and all sorts of other things like that, that will force you to not just use the shift key and crouch around everywhere you go. Because if you don't know, you can use crouch to bypass uh, skulk sensors noticing you. And that's all well and good, but like, you know, what if you couldn't just skirt around the whole not making noise thing. You have to make. Wouldn't make sense otherwise. Wouldn't be a fun game if there was no challenge. And that's the other thing. I'd like it to have a sizable challenge. Um, I don't want the player escaping on their first try. I want them to really like flounder around and fail several times and every single time gain more dungeon knowledge and go, okay, these doors and these walls and these areas can open up. Maybe if I camp around here, I can get access to an area I've never been to. Or I gain access to a place I know I need to go or something along those lines. I just, it's its a really cool idea to have a, and it would, this would be all mitigated through RNG. Um, you start the game, you hit the on switch, you, you fall into the game area, and you are not going to have the same experience every time. But that over time, you will have built up enough of a pattern, because you know, the human brain is great at recognizing patterns. You're going to build up enough of pattern recognition to go, okay, maybe if I hang around or do this, you know, this good thing might happen. Or it might not, I don't know. Maybe if I look in this area or investigate this this suspicious spot, well, maybe there's a power-up card over there. You know, that sort of thing. That's the kind of, that's the center of the brain I want to tickle, you know? That's the kind of, like, especially as someone who is making this and tailoring this experience, like, that's the kind of thing I want people to go, yeah, yeah, it all makes sense now. It clicks with me. I just love seeing that aha moment in people's eyes. And so I was also going to have, um, you don't get to immediately take advantage of the power-ups. And what that means is, in a standard Metroidvania game, when you collect a power-up, you're just immediately granted access to whatever that thing lets you do. However, in this game, to sort of, you know, continue with the lore, and because the cards, uh, the power-ups, are just gonna be map arts. And I'm gonna make these map arts, and they're gonna be really nice, and I've gotta, I'm gonna have to, like, make a stream one of these days to properly format these suckers and make them look good as map arts. Um, but of course, that's gonna be well into the game's, uh, or enough of the logic systems will already be made. Because um, this is something that Tango Tech, I've been following the man re religiously for the last six months ever since he released uh, Decked Out 2. Uh, he did when the Hermitcraft season was shutting down, uh, and that happened around New Year's. Uh, he released it to the public, so I got to actually look into his redstone and, and kind of pick his brain, if you will. But he mentioned on a stream that he did, uh, he did a post-mortem stream of Decked Out 2 to just sort of go over his
his notes and ideas of things he wanted to do, but couldn't do because of time or some other limiting factor or something. And he mentioned that he made a bunch of cards for his game, and that was some of the first design stuff he did. And that looking at it now, when the game is now over and everybody's had the chance to playtest it to hell and back, he realized that he goofed with a lot of the card design because it was just not good enough. Mostly because the cards were not properly tailored to the dungeon that Tango Tech had made. And that's unfortunate, but you know, what can you do? That would have been something like the card design process or the power-up design process is really not something you do on the front end. That's more of a, okay, I've got enough of this game's internal bits fitted together. How do they all work together and how can the player make it, make that, take it to their advantage? And so that's why I'm saying card design is going to be dead last or next to dead last. I will probably figure out what the cards all do, uh, mechanism wise, and then figure out how to implement that from a redstone perspective. And at that point, it's going to be a matter of how do I best, you know, communicate that to a player. And so, um, unlike a standard Metroidvania, you're not going to grab, because again, these are just map arts. I have no way for a map art to imbue any sort of ability to anyone. You know, a map art's just a map art at the end of the day. Um, so what I was going to do is for, you know, both for lore reasons and for the redstone mechanisms, uh, I was just going to have you, these were not going to be cards like playing cards, unlike in decked out, uh, one and two. These are going to be computer chips or computer cards or some sort of SD card. You, you almost like a USB drive, you know, something along those lines. And you're going to go and find these computer terminals scattered throughout the dungeon. And the computer terminals are the area where you, you know, you throw up or not throw up, but throw in hand in your, um, your card that you've collected. And that's how you will be given the power up and the power up will go into effect for the rest of your, your run until you die and reset the game or until you beat the game and leave both of which result in a, a reset and uh yeah like i think that's a much more interesting thing because you can die without it having been put into effect or you could get sandwiched that's unfortunate but games can't be a hundred percent you know predictable and so i was thinking of making the player make uh make a mental map in their minds uh, of where these power-up locations are not just where to find the power-up cards but also okay now i found a power-up cool where's the nearest station that I can hand this in at. That's like a good game, a good skillful game makes its player juggle mental information as much as visual and audio information. Now, sadly, speaking of audio, I don't have the audio capacity that Tango Tech had when he was designing Decked Out 2. Uh, he could make use of an audio mod. Uh, it's a fabric mod. It can globally broadcast to any server that has it installed. Obviously, 2B2D does not have this installed. It can globally broadcast pretty much any MP3 file binded to a disc, as in, you know, a, a jukebox disc. And so you can play any MP3 file via a disc in a jukebox in Minecraft with this mod. And so you can you can record announcements, you can record ambient noises, you can record monster screams, something like that, right? You can really set the table for a competent atmospheric experience. And sadly, we just don't have something like that on 2B2T. But also, thank Thankfully, for exactly the backrooms type, you know, setting, it makes very little sense for there to be much in the way of sound. Because if you're familiar with the backrooms, you know that it's an it's an abandoned, like, other than the monsters that may or may not be prowling its halls, it's like devoid of people. There are no natural sounds there. You're not going to hear cave noises. You're not going to hear, you know, the wind blowing through wherever. Like, the most ambience you get in the backrooms is the glowing buzz of the overhead lights. That's supposedly a very prominent feature of the back rooms. I'm probably not going to be able to have that because I have no way to emulate that in Minecraft. I'm, I've thought about doing note block stuff and the idea hasn't necessarily left my mind, but note blocks are like, note blocks have a sort of there's just not a whole lot you can do with. You can do a decent amount of things with notes, but you can't do that much with. And so I was thinking, and I had another uh, chatter, a chat member who gave a really good idea. Uh, synchronize a bunch of jukeboxes all throughout the dungeon that all play 13, the disc, 13. Because 13 is a reasonably creepy disc. And he's right. That is a really, really good idea. And I probably will end up doing something like that. Um, 
It's all a matter of timing, of course. I have no idea when precisely the player will be in any particular location. But it is entirely possible to, you know, make an experience like that. So audio, sadly, is going to be kind of limited in what it can do. But at the very least, you know, getting... Because, like, Alpha, bless him, Alpha Computer, before he stopped playing, because uh, real life knocked him out, he basically set up one of the last big things he did before the holidays. He set up a really big uh, disc farm. And I used it, you know, I got all the discs in the game. Um, and I didn't really think much of it. I didn't have any alternative use for it. And I was like, well, this is a cool enough build, but it's not in a place where I'm frequently, you know, I'm not loading it. 24 7 um it's it's on our gunpowder farm so i'm not like i'm not frothing at the mouth for music discs still a good idea don't get me wrong but not like it's not that special it's special but it's not that special now i think it is that special because this is how i can get tons and tons of i mean i have the diamonds for the jukeboxes but the discs are actually really fucking annoying to get your hands on but now I've got that settled. I can play any disc I want because I will have that disc. I will have access to it somehow, some way. And so like at the very least, you know, cool ideas like, yeah, synchronize the use of all of these ambient discs throughout the dungeon and just have them all play at key moments. I, I find that to be a lovely idea. Um, and so that all sounds really cool and all, but I've had problems testing in creative um exactly like how to get the the johnny named vindicators to adequately patrol the hallways i may do it with johnny vindicators i may not um i did however get extraordinarily lucky when i chose the area that i was going to build this in as me and my friends started digging out everything before we started using the tnt bombers i stumbled across a skeleton dungeon and so this also kind of gave me the idea of well wait a minute what if instead of using vindicators I made a bunch of skeletons, put them in minecarts, give them power five flame bows, and then put the skeletons in the floor to where their heads are poking out and just their heads are poking out. And then I give them a specialty helmet. So probably, I don't know, diamond, maybe netherite, we'll see. Um, and have them run on as quick of a rail line as I can manage and have them run around the dungeon in a sort of fixed pattern. And so in this way, you learn their patterns as well as you use the lockers to instead of hiding from the Johnnies, you hide from skeletons because they're going to snipe you because that's how skeletons work. And I thought, yeah, that's actually a really decent idea as well. But while the skeleton one is really easy to implement because the skeleton spawner is just right there. I don't know. It just feels like running away from a pack of vindicators is in infinitely more both scary and also like genuinely insurmountable because they can sprint they are one of the few mobs that can actually sprint um they don't really like especially if they're named johnny they don't really care about much of anything they are they are like omnicidal maniacs at that point and I just, I feel like weaponizing that aspect of the game is a really good one. So it may end up being that I do both. I have skeletons and I have Johnnies. Um, the only problem would be the infighting, which could also be easily gotten around by simply, um, and I don't like doing this because this was a problem in Decked Out 2. Uh, Decked Out 1 and Decked Out 2 had Ravagers patrolling the hallways, and those were the big threats you had to navigate around. But in Decked Out 2, Tango Tech decided to make zoning a thing, where all the Ravagers in the dungeon could not free free roam the dungeon they were locked to an area and that's it's a good idea but tango was always sort of like disappointed in how the player always was you know when you cross that threshold you're like oh i'm safe because you are you cross the threshold the ravagers cannot cross well there you go and so i wanted to avoid that by making the johnny vindicators able to just free roam wherever they will always be able to go after you no matter where you are you are never truly safe and that idea is like a really appealing one but like giving the Johnnies sort of a cordon off area where they can free roam in just that area. And then in another section or area, you know, you got skeletons and mine carts that are way down at, because I'm going to have a bunch of this area, uh, a lot of the dungeon is going to be slabbed off. So, you know, it'll be predominantly half slabs. And so you will uh, see these skeleton heads zoom through the floor. And obviously they can shoot you, I believe. I'm pretty sure. I'll have to test it to be safe. But like, I'm fairly certain they can shoot you in that type of 
circumstance. And so you're just kind of like, what the? Yeah, you may not have even been paying attention long enough to have noticed, oh, a skeleton was what actually just shot at me. Like, that's kind of the thing. I want to have a variety of challenges and threats to keep the player on their toes. So it may be that I end up just doing both. Um, we'll have to see. And then obviously with this randomized, um, you know, layout shifting uh, dungeon model, I do want to be extra careful to prevent dead ends and non-viable routes. I would like to ideally have all po at all possible times, there will always be a route out of the dungeon. There will always be a, a victory condition. You know, I'd, I would hate for a player to queue up and be like, yeah, I'm going to play Escape the Jack Rooms. I'm going to get out and I'm going to I'm going to do great. I'm going to have a fun run and it's going to be great. And the run was doomed from the get go because there was never a viable uh, path to victory. That would feel so terrible. And and that's just, I, I ain't about that. I enjoy people actually having a fair, a fair shake, a fair chance. And so I definitely want to make sure to balance how you will route your way out and in what directions you can route your way out, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, that's the, the dungeon design is integral to the success of the game. I've also considered, because you're probably going to be doing a lot of running around, um, I've also considered what food source, because you're going to go in with a preset loadout. Um, you're not going in with many items. You're going to go in with yellow dyed armor and you're going to go in basically toolless. And so I want to supply the player with food in a somewhat unique way. Uh, Tango Tech in his decked out too had berry bushes, every, the, the sweet berries. And I thought about doing that, but then I thought, no, I don't want to do, if I can avoid doing something Tango Tech did, I will avoid doing it. I want to do my own thing as much as possible. And so supplying berry bushes everywhere doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because why would that be in the back rooms, you know? But then again, why would anything be in the back rooms? Um, so to that end, I figure you will find random helpful items from a, a sort of pool of items, possible items. And these will be in lockers that will be randomly you know, dispensed using uh, various, there are various ways of uh, randomly assorting loot into a chest or into a container. So that's not hard to do. So I was thinking of having that be, you know, there will always be certain uh, locker locations, lockers that will have barrels inside them. And the barrels will have, you know, uh, raw, raw cod or maybe raw salmon, maybe a, a one odd health or regen potion, you know, something along those lines, something to keep you in the game just that much more. And obviously, if you're running from Johnny's and you're running from, you know, dodging skeletons and the like all the time, yeah, it's a it's an important thing to be able to keep that pace going because you'll run out of hunger and starve to death, you know, on good old 2B2T. Um, and that would be a very anticlimactic way to lose. If you must die and lose, I would prefer it be to a monster. I wouldn't really want you to die because of starvation. Um, but obviously, in a situation like that, that's very realistic. So I have to, you know, figure out what sort of food I want the players to have a reasonable level of access to and then maybe kind of scale back a little bit from that to increase the difficulty you know some runs food will be more scarce and on some runs food will be less scarce that kind of thing and so uh, I have ad adopted a sort of model that I call um, because in decked out 2 before you even began the game you would select off of a, a panel your difficulty now, that's all well and good and I don't mind a difficulty selector but I actually don't want there to be a difficulty selector for my game I want the difficulty to wax and wane as the day and the night cycles pass, as well as if lightning strike. But I also want some of the power-ups to soften the difficulty because, well, I mean, that would be the point of a power-up, wouldn't it? You know, that's that's the value in going out of your way to collect such an item in the first place. You are given something of a breath of fresh air because you got this thing and it gives you this bonus. And that bonus is, oh, well, the dungeon's now slightly less difficult for a time. That kind of idea. I also uh, loosely flirted with the idea of save points, but I don't think the game is large enough to really warrant save points, even though you will have variants and random, you know, room shuffle. Um, I don't think a save point system is necessary. Also, like you're going to set your bed before you go into the, the dungeon, before you start playing the game. I want you to have the respawn when you die being uh, outside the dungeon in the ready room. I don't really want you to be respawning inside the dungeon. That feels too, too easy, you know? I've also considered having areas be 
overgrown and sort of like, you'll have the pristine pool rooms, back rooms area. And then you might have one section of the back rooms area that's very like moldy and rotten. And maybe it's beginning to grow some fungus growth on it. You know, something wild and crazy like with glowberries or a bit of uh, what is it? Those lush caves is encroaching into the back rooms maybe. Or I design something entirely alien and creepy looking. I don't know, something like that. That could really do wonders. And I just feel like this is a great medium for like making a diverse, crazy experience. I also thought, um, and for this problem, for this little idea, I'm gonna need a lot of dragon's breath. I thought of having certain areas be booby-trapped with poison and instant harming lingering potions and have these sort of like if you screw up or if you go into an area or you mess up or you maybe you make too much noise in a certain room um panels in the ceiling flip open and boop, 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 out comes some lingering potions of you know harming two and now you've got giant puddles of harming two that you have to or not puddles clouds of harming two that you've got to skirt around that's a big deal now uh, this makes a lot of things way more troublesome than were previously. That kind of thing. So, like, you know, anyone willing to donate me... Because, like, I can only really do this if I have enough Dragon's Breath already on hand. And I've only got, like, a stack and a half in total. And I don't feel like going to the end just to get, like, a shulker of Dragon's Breath or something. Um, totally doable, but also a pain in the ass. So, you know how it is. Um, anyone willing to donate such a wonderful item, like a shulker of Dragon's Breath, would probably do it for a good long while. Like, I'd be happy to have that. Um, that sort of a donation would be phenomenal. But hey, no pressure. Um, I already kind of touched on this, but um, unlike in Decked Out 2, where you go in totally naked with no extra items, no, none of that, This in this game, I've given the player um, yellow dyed leather Full leather armor with uh, whatever level one enchantment the table decided to give me. And so I wanted to kind of like give a large amount of variance to like, uh, for example, some of these leather pieces have projectile protection. Some of these have regular protection. Some of these have blast protection. The boots may have feather falling on them. They may just have regular old f uh, protection on them. They may the, the helmet has aqua affinity on some of these. Like that's not super useful. But, you know, some runs, your leather will be better than others. And I kind of like that idea. You always suit up before you go into the back rooms. And that makes every run kind of different. Um, I've also thought about an item retrieval system for if you do happen to die, because the areas you're going to be in are hopefully going to be preset areas, um, I would like an item retrieval system of some kind to effectively get all the crap you had on you back. After all, I would hate to, to lose out on some of these things if they can be reused. And you know, I kind of like the idea of hand-me-down uh, leather armor from previous runs. It's just, it just feels interesting to see, you know, what did somebody else do? How badly did they damage their armor? Like, am I going to have to pay the price for someone else's carelessness? Or, or worse, my own carelessness because I've been running, you know, several runs back to back. And so now, you know, something along those lines. We might have a um, item reclamation system, a voluntary one and an involuntary one. Uh, it just depends. It just depends. And then lastly, um, speaking of escaping the dungeon, uh, when you do finally get out, I've already kind of more or less thought about this. Um, so back when I was doing the spirit journey, I was uh, running through, for those of you who didn't see any of the live streams, it was just me running through all the old bases and places that I had I'd been before. And uh, something I did on the nether highways was I made a game out of going out of my way to kill any withers that I found. I didn't really need to, but I was like, I'm going to do something with these nether stars that I've gotten from all these withers. You know, I'm going to put them to good use. Because as you know, there are probably a million withers all on all the highways collected. Um, simply an innumerable amount of withers are out there. And so I thought, well, what if I incorporated the nether stars from those withers into a reasonable outlet, you know, into something crazy or interesting, something that's not like just make a beacon, you know, making a beacon is so, it's not surprising, you know? Like, that's what you do with nether stars. You make beacons out of them. And that's fine. But, like, what if all the nether withers around spawn were, like, ground up into a fine paste and then turned into the greatest, I don't know, uh, coffee in the universe? 
or something. Like, you know, what if we're what if we're missing an application for something that you would otherwise not see as normal or, or not see as special? And so that's what I thought to do. I thought to incorporate a lot of the spawn withers and just make them into a a sort of accidental like so basically I need to explain how you get out of the dungeon for this next part to make sense. So you get out, you figure out however it is you're you're meant to get out. Uh, you figure out the route you, you're supposed to take. And along the way, you find a renamed Nether Star, a Glimmer of Despair. And this renamed Nether Star is the key that you must then submit into a hopper. And this key is what gets you out. It opens up the secret, the, well, I say secret, but the, it opens up the path, uh, the piping in front of you. It'll be copper piping, waterlogged, and you'll be free to get out now. And in so doing, this shuts off the game. So this is the, the start or the restart system. And it more or less turns on all the beacons and stuff. And it allows you to swim freely to the surface where you are now about as safe as is reasonably possible. And the game is effectively over at this point. And so I want to sort of make this something of an Easter egg hunt. I guess is the right way to put it. I wouldn't mind a sort of, um, oh, I found the place I need to go kind of mindset, but then whoopsie. Uh, and then partway through the player has, uh, <clears throat> they realize the door is locked and they don't have the exit, which is that uh, renamed nether star. So I just, I feel like it's a great way to sort of tie in a bit of 2B2T, you know, I don't want to say legacy, but a bit of like the, the habits of people making withers on the highways and stuff like to tie that into the game in some manner like that's a cool idea to me you know it incorporates the greater 2b2t as a whole it's not just oh i need this one random ass item because jack said i need it like to actually have that item have a purpose and have some sort of significance to 2b2t as a whole i kind of like that you know um i've always been a fan of the shape and style of the nether star itself i kind of wish the nether star was a crafting ingredient in more stuff but uh oh well what can you do um so i figure you know, we'll have this sort of uh, wonderful mini game. Although I don't know, it may not be so mini anymore by the time I'm done with it. It may be a very big game by the time I'm done with it. This is uh, well, this is one of those things where, especially if a lot of people give me good ideas. And remember, if you have a good idea, I've more or less run through the list at this point. Uh, there are only like two or three more items I've got to hit upon. If you've got a great idea, by all means, give it to me. I will happily try and make make use of it if that is in, if that is at all possible. But yeah, the uh, the only other major important bit is just having an underwater maze slash um i mean i know people don't really like underwater mazes but like it is back rooms pool rooms themed there's going to be a lot of water so a water themed you know death maze kind of makes sense but obviously i don't want it to be too unfair or anything and then obviously the uh this this probably goes without saying but uh this was very much the very first thing i thought of uh copious amounts of secret passages and lots of little hidden nooks and crannies that are maybe not vital for progression, but interesting places to take note of. You know, uh, you would be rewarded to know that this little spot is here. I also want to make use of um, smooth quartz predominantly and just sort of join and conjoin all these areas together to make it feel seamless so that you can't tell where there are uh, passages or other such things in the walls and the like. Um, I just sort of I like the idea, and I've been perusing a lot of builds that have these these ideas in them. I like the idea of you walking right by a passageway and not having a clue that that was even there, simply because the passageway itself was seamless. And that's kind of like my design philosophy. That's what I want to make. I want to make every little bit of connecting and redirecting area as seamless as possible. I might even throw in a few drowned. Um, Decked Out 2 had a really nasty drowned named One-Eyed Willy. He had a trident in his hand and his aim was mean. And he killed more people in that game than I think any of the other hazards all combined. One-Eyed Willy was a wonder, I tell you. And so I thought, you know, what if I could make my own version of him, but not call him One-Eyed Willy, call him like the Beast from the Depths or some shit like that, you know. Because uh, there are, in Backroom's lore, there are water-bound monsters and the like that are like unseen and out of the way, but will will absolutely tear you a new one if you wander into their territory. So that was that was also a big sort of inspiration that I had. So yes, that more or less concludes all the ideas and thoughts that I've had so far. If you've got a great one or just even a small tiny idea or change or something along those lines you'd like to see, you know, by all means, leave a comment down below. I will happily, you know, accept all possible types of uh, suggestion. Um, I find that uh, bases and projects and other things like this, you know, they get better with a set amount of suggestion. Uh, being open to suggestions is always a good idea. 
idea. And obviously, I would like for you to uh, join our Discord as well. Uh, that's also linked down below, as well as uh, follow me on Twitter. And if you like my uh, my rambly bits, make sure to subscribe. You know, I've got lots of these planned. And uh, other than that, I've been uh, I've been Jack the Ripper. I've been I've been Rambly Man. I've been trying to get this game going. And uh, yeah, this thing is gonna suck up all of my time for the foreseeable future, I have a feeling. Uh, many a stream will likely be focused on how to best implement this, how to best do that, that sort of thing. So yes, thank you all so much for coming out and giving me a moment of your time. Make sure to, uh, you know, do all the regular stuff. At least leave a like or a, a comment or something along those lines. And uh, if you especially believe that I've deserved your time, you know, you can join our membership, uh, help support the channel even more. And other than that, I will catch you all later.